Uh, so, thank you very much for joining us this late hour. Uh, but firstly, our thanks go to Simon, who kindly agreed, uh, despite his very tight schedule and short stay in Tbilisi, to, to visit yet another time our campus and our university and give us a very interesting uh, overview and presentation of his very recent book, which I'm very proud to receive with, with the author's signature, so I'm really honored by that. And plus, oh, this has uh, visited I mean, to our campus and to the country has nicely coincided with the announcement of the Doing Business uh, 2015 result. I think this uh, audience knows well that Simon is one of the uh, architects of this rating, the ideology and the methodology and um, so bolts and nuts of it. And I think his uh, views on, on, on the results, recent changes and so on would be of interest for you. Okay, Simon, thank you very much for all is yours. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, I'm visiting for the day, and then I thought uh, I'd like to see the university and how it's developing, um, and uh, maybe have a short, uh, short talk. So I wouldn't call it a lecture. I'll just say um, a few, um, a few things. Um, and while indeed the uh, main point was about uh, my book Inside the Euro Crisis, which came ab came out about two or three months ago. Um, we have actually another book, which is probably coming literally at the end of this uh, week, which is dedicated to 25 years of transition in the whole region, uh, where I'm one of the two co-editors. I was hoping that I would be presenting that tonight, but I'll come separately for that book. That book is interesting because in it there is a chapter on uh, Georgia written by Kaha Bendukids and uh, um, President Saakashvili, but a lot of the people um, uh, of uh, their team, I'm sure, have contributed quite a bit uh, uh, in that uh, chapter. So uh, next time, which may be very soon, I promise to uh, present uh, not just the Georgia part, which you know well, uh, but also what happened in a number of other countries, including in my own country, in um, some of the leading reformers like the Czech, Czech Republic and Poland, and a good summary of 25 years of, um, of transition where we are uh, now. Instead, since this is not quite ready, um, instead what I'll talk today is combine some of these uh, uh, topics and talk a bit about uh, Georgia and Europe, roughly speaking. You've recently joined, uh, signed an association agreement with uh, the European Union. This is very exciting. Uh, it was very exciting when uh, Bulgaria signed such an agreement uh, 10 years or so um, uh, ago. But with that come, come lots of expectations, uh, some of which have been met and many of which have not been actually met, at least in the case of Bulgaria and I would argue a number of other countries. Uh, so maybe this is where uh, I thought we would uh, we would go tonight. Um, but before I get to Georgia and, uh, and uh, Europe, as some of you, some of you who have worked uh, uh, in the government and so on, uh, think of the association agreement uh, recently uh, signed. It was, so it is the fruit of a very long process uh, of which uh, not this government, but the previous, previous, previous governments have all worked to um, to get to that uh, point. And in some small ways, I've also been uh, involved in that, not the agreement itself, but some of the uh, efforts of previous governments to get to the point of, um, of having such a, uh, an agreement. So I'll start with that a few words. I actually first came as part of the World Bank to um, Tbilisi in the winter of 1997, so a long time um, ago. In fact, it was one of my first assignments for the World Bank. And my task at the time was to try to convince the then uh, government, Shevardnadze's uh, government, to do microeconomic reforms. Um, I personally quickly found out that no reforms are going to happen here, so there is no much point to um, uh, 
to spend significant time on that and asked to be reassigned to another country. Um, then my director at the time uh, said, well, we have another project in Georgia. Would you like to shift to it? And I said, well, what is the project? And they said, advising on uh, privatizing and uh, modernizing the wine industry. And said, so, okay, I don't know anything about wine, but, um, you know, let's try. So actually, maybe even the people that I've worked for a long time here don't know, but my first real project in Georgia was trying to advise the then state-owned wineries and cognac makers how to make and market wine and uh, so on. I don't think it was a very successful project since I didn't know much about it, uh, but I got to spend a lot of um, time in, uh, in Georgia and when uh, the Rose Revolution came, I was one of the few people at the World Bank who actually consistently over a period of six, seven years had uh, visited Georgia and uh, knew something about uh, its uh, economy, regulation and, uh, and so on. And from 2004 to about 2008 maybe, I was coming quite often and working with um, the governments then on improving the business environment. This is when this idea of doing business in Georgia and let's improve not just on this ranking, but on all the other rankings uh, that exist uh, came about and we worked, uh, especially the government worked very hard to get from, I forget what it was, 150th or 104th, 112th, I think at some point it was even worse than that, but there are fewer countries then, so maybe it sounds like, um, it was to, I think, number eight was uh, 2000 and uh, uh, was the best uh, ranking, which Georgia has lost uh, this year, but this is a different, uh, a different story. So a very, very big um, success over really a period, of, um, uh, a period of time, and a big success not just for this region, but anywhere actually in the world. We haven't seen... Um, at the World Bank such a rapid um, improvement over such a period of uh, time. There were reforms in many other areas. I remember, for example, the early period 97-8 when uh, we were constantly being stopped by uh, the police driving around police. So you basically had to hire somebody who is police so that the police doesn't uh, stop you when you uh, drive and this type of things that hopefully are forgotten by, um, by now, by, um, by most. And here we are sort of 10 years after the reforms uh, started 2004 with uh, an association agreement um, and looking towards some time in the hopefully not so distant future to join the European Union. Joining the European Union is very exciting. I remember in Bulgaria when uh, we managed to get the um, invitation about a decade ago, what excitement it was. Uh, but it also raised the expectations of uh, the Bulgarian society greatly. Basically, the thinking was that now it, once we are truly in... Um, in Europe, they're going to give us lots of investment, they're going to basically help us to run our country better, they're going to invest in infrastructure, it's going to be great. Uh, and for some countries of Central and Eastern Europe, you can say that that sort of happened. The further north you are, the more you can say that. Uh, but for other countries like Bulgaria, like Romania, um, like Hungary, uh, like uh, Slovakia to some extent, actually didn't quite happen. So the countries entered the European um, Union with very high expectations. Um, and for a couple of years, it seemed like things are going to be significantly better. And then for various domestic political reasons or issues of corruption, um, quickly uh, money from the European Union were cut for substantial periods of time. Uh, and if you look back in some of the Central European countries, this year it's 10 years since uh, entry into the EU. In Bulgaria and Romania it's 7 years. Um, there are some improvements certainly, so societies have, uh, have changed uh, tremendously. But there are also many areas where there is more skepticism and more um, negative views on the entry into the European Union. Uh, than certainly were, uh, were at the beginning. 
Why am I saying that? Uh, I'm saying that to make the point that it's good to enter the European uh, market, both politically and, uh, and economically. It can bring a lot of uh, benefits. But basically, whatever your government does, whatever Georgia does for itself is the most important. Nobody else is going to do much, uh, much for you. Uh, my book, incidentally, that was shown today is sort of on the same topic. I became finance minister in Bulgaria in July of 2009, just as the financial crisis was um, starting to develop. And for the next about four years, I spent uh, almost as much time in Brussels as I spent in um, Bulgaria dealing with the Eurozone crisis and, and uh, Greece and uh, Spain and Ireland and uh, Portugal and so on collapsing one after uh, another. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion in the country of ways the EU to help us with infrastructure, ways the EU to help us with social funds. They were helping a lot, but it was perceived that uh, it should be more. And the answer was, well, the EU is very busy fighting its own crisis, the Eurozone, uh, uh, the Eurozone crisis. And that's the main uh, issue that for the last four or five years has been on the EU, um, EU agenda. And again, basically, unless you do uh, such uh, reforms or such uh, changes that your country, what depends on you, is done, entry into the European Union in itself is not going to help you that, uh, that uh, much. The early government, certainly in Bulgaria, didn't understand that. So they truly thought that once you're part of the European Union, many of your issues uh, um, are resolved, and it did not turn turned out to be uh, the case. Uh, and it didn't turn out to be the case in a number of other countries, uh, which is why that after the financial crisis now, the Eurozone crisis has been going on for five, in some cases six years. When you look at the political landscape in Europe, you see a lot of nationalist parties, not just in the poorer countries, but actually also in some rich countries, uh, the ones saying, well, the EU is not helping us enough, roughly speaking, so why should we be so focused on Europe? And uh, nationalist parties in the north saying, well, why should we be helping these guys at all? They're not really grateful for what we are doing um, for uh, them. So if you've looked at the last two years, European Parliament elections, uh, local elections, um, you would notice that in a number of countries, uh, both in the north and the south, nationalist parties actually have picked up quite, uh, quite uh, significantly. Again, because there were expectations on each side that the one would grow and develop as uh, democracies very uh, fast and very successfully, and would become like uh, the other part of Europe, and it didn't quite happen for most countries. It uh, it uh, didn't. And in the East, an understanding that there will be a lot more assistance, a lot more guidance, a lot more help, and that also didn't come, um, that also didn't come through. So the point of this uh, discussion so far, whatever you do, do it regardless of which block you're in. The block can only help you go further uh, and expand uh, your um, uh, economic prospects, but it cannot do it for you. Um, so given that, uh, the, to the other topic that we um, wanted a bit to discuss today is regulations, improvements in um, uh, the economy, the certainty of, um, of doing uh, business, as you may have seen today, or you'll see by uh, Tomorrow in the media, this is a year that the Doing Business Index that was started 12, 13 years ago happened to come out uh, today and the results for Georgia are, let's say, um, less positive than they have been in the last three, four, five, um, uh, five years. So there has been a, a decline in the relative ranking of uh, Georgia. Some of that is due to methodological changes. So there are some changes to the indicators that uh, basically helped some countries, hurt some other countries. So on average, um, uh, the methodology was neutral, but it uh, dropped some countries, uh, Georgia as well, by a couple of places. 
But if you look carefully at the results, um, what you also see is that for the same regulation, so regulation hasn't changed, the laws have not changed in, um, uh, in Georgia, at least on the indicators that are covered in doing business, but in a couple of places, one is paying taxes, the efficiency with which these laws and regulations uh, uh, are used, or at least the perception of this efficiency, has deteriorated. In other words, businesses now think that it takes longer time, and actually it's uncertain how long it takes to do the particular procedures, filing annual reports, uh, doing tax uh, reporting and so on, that it, it did in the past. So in other words, regulations stayed the same, but applying that regulation start suddenly, or not suddenly, over the last uh, year, started being um, a lot more uncertain. Or you can say a lot more um, uh, uneven. So sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're not happy. As a result, on average, you don't quite know uh, what you do. And for investors, this is quite bad because uh, you want to have a lot of predictability, especially with regards to um, uh, procedures like like tax compliance, because if you don't have that predictability, it's also very hard for you uh, to plan your business investments, to plan your next year's um, next year's sales, and uh, and so on. So something is happening in the data. It's early to tell for me, at least, since I'm no longer part of the doing business team, I haven't had enough time to analyze what exactly is happening. But what seems to be happening is that uh, at least a large section of businesses that are interviewed by the doing business team uh, are less clear what the rules are. And since the rules haven't changed, at first this is a bit strange. It's normal if a rule changes for you at first not to know exactly what's happening. So some time... Um, is necessary to be clear on the application of the rule. But if the rules have not changed, they've stayed the same, and suddenly you have increased uh, uncertainty on how they are applied, well, that means that whoever is applying it, the agency that is applying it, somehow is doing things that it shouldn't be doing, or at least is perceived to be doing things that it shouldn't be um, doing. From that perspective, it would be quite interesting to uh, see what happens for the next year's um, uh, for the next year's uh, doing business report because more and more of the uh, indicators in it, more and more of the rankings will have an increased component of this, if you like, certainty or, or uncertainty of applying the uh, indicators. The perception on the side of uh, business, given the same uh, the same. Uh, regulations and that we know for investors is quite uh, is quite important so going back then to europe and maybe even the rest of um, uh, the rest of the world 10 years ago georgia basically was either not known to the rest of the world or if it was known it was known with the fact that you know there was no electricity most of the time that you know the police was extremely corrupt that you have to drive backwards on some streets because for some reason there were one-way streets where they shouldn't have been and all these kind of things that sound good in dinner conversation but you don't really want to be uh, associated with uh, them so that's 10 years ago not such a long time um, ago and then in a period of several years there was a tremendous progress and an explanation of that uh, progress for the rest of the world. So Georgia received and currently has um, an image internationally of a small country that uh, managed to overcome the difficulties of the post-communist transition, the particular, um, the particular features of the local uh, Georgian um, uh, transition to become a model transition economy. And this is why there has been so much interest both by uh, financial institutions like the World Bank, my own old institution, and uh, foreign investors. Uh, now we're in a situation where, as I mentioned, on some aspects of the business environment, investors are not so sure actually whether this is the environment that they face or there's some other environment that doesn't look like uh, the regulations suggested, but uh, it may be in, um, in uh, place. This is combined with the picture in the emerging markets overall, 
which is actually not very beneficial to any of the emerging markets where some of the large emerging markets, Russia, you know the issues well, Brazil also on the other side, basically have no growth uh, and seem like they're not going to have growth for some time. The Indian economy after a decade of high growth basically has um, near collapsed. China is slowing down and a few other, Argentina is doing, the government in Argentina is doing strange things, Venezuela, you know, even more. Um, so suddenly emerging markets, which for the last 12, 13 years have been the excitement for most investors, are no longer that exciting, or maybe they're too exciting, so investors don't really want to spend so much time um, into them. So if you look roughly for the last two years, started sometime in uh, late summer of 2012, and especially last year was the case, there is actually a pullback from investment in emerging markets as a group. Uh, not specific emerging markets, but overall, uh, um, investment in emerging markets have actually both this year, but also last year, gone down significantly. Investors just don't have the appetite to go into these uh, riskier markets. If on top of that, uh, you put the fact that um, here in Georgia there seems to be some uh, recently created uncertainty about how rules are applied in certain areas, it makes it even more difficult to think how things can develop in the future in the same consistent uh, way of having relatively high uh, economic growth rate uh, that uh, Georgia has enjoyed for nearly a, uh, nearly a decade. Um, but since I don't want to finish sounding very, <laughs> very negative, so what, what, can, what does this um, uh, teach, us, uh, teach us? Well, as I mentioned, accession to the European Union is going to be a longer process than for most uh, Central and East European economies, precisely because the EU has a lot of issues on its own to resolve. The European economy, most European economies have had uh, significant issues uh, internally, and looks like these issues will continue. Um, so we cannot say that in two years, in three years, in five years, uh, we can talk about uh, Georgia in the European Union, but I'm sure that in a decade or so, Georgia will be part of the European um, Union. And in this process, as long as it's credible, there'll certainly be a pickup in interest uh, uh, on the side of investors, investors just because of political uncertainty uh, being diminished significantly uh, once you enter the um, European Union. And of course, the ability to use uh, EU funds more so than um, uh, than now. But as a very small country, uh, smaller than the majority of countries in the um, European uh, uh, Union, any shift that happens either in regulations or laws or in the usage of these regulations and uh, laws has a lot bigger effect than in a large country in terms of changing both investment senti investors' sentiment but also the views for the rest of the world of what is happening in this, uh, uh, in this uh, economy and how likely it is that it is going to be a high-growth uh, high uh, economy. In that regard, uh, indicators like doing business help. They don't give you the full picture, they're just one small part of the picture, but they say, well, here it seems like the um, improvement that have been achieved is sustained, and that's good. You should always try to do more, but at least it's sustained. In some indicators, it seems like that uh, maintaining the uh, achievements that have been done is no longer there, or is shaky. Uh, and it's very dangerous to go in this direction because it's very easy once, uh, once you make a couple of uh, wrong steps to continue down that, uh, uh, that uh, path. There have been countries, and I will uh, finish uh, with this, in the book that I mentioned, the 25 years of uh, transition, um, we started writing it as a very positive book. Look, these countries were all under communism 25 years ago, and now, with a few exceptions in Central Asia, they've converted to um, uh, some forms of democracy, most of them uh, uh, full, um, full democracy, and basically have gone a long way towards, uh, towards uh, free markets. 
but in particular countries, you have actually also seen what we call uh, reform reversal. So a country starts developing well. One example is Hungary. The country starts as a big reformer, and Hungary did start as one of, if not the biggest reformer, uh, certainly one of the two big reformers together with Poland, in 89, 90, 91, until about 95, 96. And since then, Hungary has done nothing. So if you compare GDP per capita, 1996 in Hungary, and if you compare now, it's barely grown. The growth in, what, 18 years is about 20% uh, or so. In that same period, countries like Poland and Estonia more than doubled, actually in the one case tripled, uh, uh, GDP per capita. So there are countries that start well and then get stuck. There are countries like Slovakia that start a bit, get stuck for a long uh, time without uh, reforms and actually even a reversal of reforms, improve again and then again start um, uh, reversing my own country has experienced this up and down, up and down, including most uh, uh, most recently. And there are very few countries that have consistently over the period of 2020 some uh, uh, years uh, have followed a more or less consistent path to both political freedom as well as economic uh, freedom. But if you look at the 25 countries in our uh, sorry, there are about 30 countries actually in the Central and East European um, uh, region, including the former Soviet Union. You can main, maybe count three, four countries, the Baltics mostly, maybe the Czech Republic, that can have consistently gone towards uh, freer markets and also um, more open um, political system. Everybody else, sometimes for a short time, sometimes for a long time, has had reversals, or at least delays, or slowdowns. Um, so I'll finish with this. I hope that uh, Georgia doesn't have a reversal. I hope that it doesn't have a significant um, uh, slowdown, uh, because it's quite costly. You compare with everybody else. You compare, as I mentioned, Hungary, how far ahead of everybody else it was in the mid-90s, 20 years ago. You compare Hungary now, in terms of economic growth, it's been, and level of economic development, it, been, it has been surpassed by another six countries in the region. It was number two after Slovenia at the beginning of the process, now it's number eight. Um, and that's even at the top, not to mention some of the countries like Ukraine, I would not go into a discussion of Ukraine, uh, where there were very big hopes, very big support from um, uh, financial institutions, both private and uh, public, and basically in 25 years, the GDP per capita today of Ukraine is 25% less than it was in 1989. So in 25 years, you've lost 25% of your GDP per, uh, per capita. Uh, there are a couple of other countries, incidentally, like this, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, that are now poorer than they were 25 years uh, ago. So transition has many dimensions, some quite successful, some not so successful, but generally going in the right uh, direction. And some countries that started but never got, uh, uh, got uh, anywhere. Georgia for 10 years has gone consistently and has been a star performer after late start. So the first 10 or so years of, uh, 15 really years of transition were lost to Georgia. Then it had to catch up. Now it's slowing down again. Uh, there is no more convergence. Hopefully that uh, changes and next year we, well, we can meet before next year, but by next year we have, we have some um, more positive uh, forecast to go forward. So I'll finish here, not talk too much. And um, if you have some uh, comments or questions, please. It's not really, it's, it's basically populism, but you need to call it something positive, so you call it flexible fiscal policy, um, uh, which basically says 
which comes from mostly from southern Europe. Uh, France, Italy are the main proponents, but it has a few other proponents on and off. Um, that says, you know, this is a period that's been hard consistently for Europe. Uh, money is very cheap, so why don't we continue having um, high deficits? And European Union, in this regard, is uh, has difficulty addressing it. If it was a small economy and it said that, they would say, will penalize you so heavily that you immediately forget about flexible uh, fiscal policy. But if it's Italy and France, okay, maybe this is a good idea, so let's... Um, let's discuss it. So I think it's a, first of all, it's a very double standard um, to have, um, depends on who, who it comes from. But there is this idea of flexible fiscal policy. Uh, again, it's not really flexible, it basically just says that sometimes over even longer periods of time than we thought before, you can run um, large deficits. That idea, actually economic theory, can tell you in principle, it can work in emerging markets. So you can have an emerging market where the growth prospects are such in the future uh, that if you think you can help it with uh, bigger government investment, private as well, by the way, but government investment mostly in infrastructure so that you help the private economy develop, um, you know, even basic economics tell you that over some period of time you can run uh, consistent uh, budget deficits as long as they are invested in uh, productive assets or productive infrastructure. Uh, and then uh, the private sector grows fast as a result of that. In fact, several of the East Asian countries in the past have done that. If you look at um, Thailand or Malaysia, um, in the 80s and early 90s, they did run uh, large, uh, large deficits for a while. Uh, both of these countries and most other countries that did that, after that had very significant crisis. So there is no way of avoiding crisis if you are running, uh, if you are running uh, flexible fiscal policies. Sooner or later, you are going to have a big uh, crisis. And in the case of the East Asian countries, it came in the late, uh, mid to late. Uh, 1990s. But at least the theory of it is that if you have high growth prospects and you think that you are far from your production possibility frontier, then it may make sense. But if you are thinking of countries like Italy or um, France that are basically mature economies, or most of the European uh, countries, it's a struggle to think where exactly is this uh, gap in the production possibility frontier that uh, that they have to fill. In other words, is there some capacity that they are currently not utilizing and they will utilize if you do this uh, investment? And the answer is no. So, what so the economic theory tells you that what they call flexible fiscal policy is just governments unwilling to do the type of reforms that they need to do so that eventually they can return to some um, significant uh, Growth, uh, growth path. And the reason these countries, in addition to being mature economies, are unlikely later on to have a very significant pickup of growth is their demographic situation, which is different from the demographic situation here, which is different from the demographic situation in uh, Asia, which is that their workforce is also shrinking over time, all of Europe, but in particular several of the countries in uh, in Europe, basically every year there are fewer and fewer workers. So not only it's hard to see where higher productivity is going to come from in the future, if you have more public investment, but it's also not clear who would be actually these extra workers so that extensively you can uh, create more uh, production. So on that, uh, my view has always been you first need to stay within roughly within the deficit close to zero or close to um, a target prescribed by uh, Maastricht, maybe even less. When I was finance minister in Bulgaria, we passed a law to basically have the deficit below 2% uh, every, uh, every year. Uh, and the more you go beyond uh, that, the more and more examples we have uh, certainly around Europe that eventually you're going to have a major uh, public finance uh, crisis, and then you're really also going to have a collapse of, uh, of, uh, of the economy. Uh, I'll just finish with uh, the topic that 
the US, because I know that the US also has discussed this, um, uh, this topic and incidentally went away from it. So the budget deficit there has shrunk very significantly in the last three, four years. But they had this uh, uh, discussion. Um, they had the discussion that unlike Europe, um, the population there is actually expanding. So there are more and more workers every year. So they can afford actually in principle to, um, uh, to grow their labor force and then to pick up productivity uh, there. But after the discussion there, they still thought given that, it's unlikely to come up with a, a good scheme to invest public resources efficiently. Um, so let's not do it. And the deficit, which about four years or five years ago was nearly 13%, uh, is now about 2.6%, I think, for this, uh, for this year. Maybe there will be some breakthrough in economic thinking to tell us that that's not the case, but so far I think both uh, theory and evidence suggest that uh, on some things you shouldn't be very flexible. Other points? Yes, Veto. So, uh, what is your assessment of the currency peg which um, Bulgaria already exercises uh, for 15 years, I guess? I may preempt your answer as a scholar, but uh, all the criticisms to currency peg come from, from let's say, empiric, uh, in brackets, evidence is managing the crisis. So you were in charge of, as a minister of finance, uh, to manage the crisis in your country. So what is now your view on the currency peg? So Bulgaria implemented the currency pack actually a bit more even than 15 years ago. So we have quite a lot of um, experience uh, with it. And with the exception of Lithuania, we are now, I think, the only country in the EU that has had the currency pack for so long, but is not yet uh, a member of the Eurozone because uh, Latvia, Estonia, uh, Slovakia entered the uh, Eurozone uh, before us. So in some sense, uh, the discussion in Bulgaria is bigger than most other countries, being, okay, you're on the PEC for so long, but you're not on the euro. So some of the benefits of, in principle, um, the PEC, you're not, uh, you're not uh, earning. So why are you still on, um, on the PEC? Um, so when I was finance minister, I always defended the PEC. Um, so uh, as an economist, I would have thought otherwise most of the time. Um, but uh, as finance minister, something that was already given was for a long time in Bulgaria. I didn't want to have any discussion of uh, what's the alternative. Um, but I can have such a discussion now. So on the positive side, the peg in Bulgaria was put not so much because of monetary policy, although that of course was the immediate concern after the banking crisis in 1996-97, but because it was thought, I think very correctly, that uh, institutions in Bulgaria are not mature enough, they are corrupt enough, so that if you leave such an important uh, policy in the hands of Bulgaria, basically sooner or later it would be screwed up. Basically, Bulgarian politicians of uh, different uh, different parties and over over time. So I think the PEG was very helpful in avoiding Bulgarian politicians dreaming up uh, monetary policies. Not that a small country like Bulgaria can have an independent monetary policy, really. But you always have uh, crazy people in politics who somehow think that that they'll do something new and innovative and different from everybody else. So I think I like the currency pack because it eliminated the need in parliament or by governments to discuss monetary policy and by the central bank to do anything. Uh, and there was a big discussion when I was finance minister that no, see countries with flexible exchange rates like Poland especially, um, were doing significantly better during the financial crisis, which is true, factually. Um, and, uh, but there are also some countries like Romania that were not doing better, so you can always point, uh, point to examples. And the argument was, 
given what I've written in the book, how inefficient European institutions showed to be during this crisis, maybe the Bulgarian Central Bank is actually a better institution to run a better version. You know, it's not the best, but maybe it beats the Europeans. And certainly for a period of time, it seemed like um, that was the case. Uh, but more recently, if you followed, I doubt that many people have followed Bulgarian news, but one of our largest banks uh, is about, I think, to, uh, to go into uh, bankruptcy. And it seems the evidence suggests that the central bank has, over a long period of time, consistently mishandled uh, its uh, supervision. So in other words, that our central bank is not as good as we thought, maybe actually it's not good at all. So from that perspective, having the peg, just not having at all in the policy um, area discussion of monetary policy is actually a good um, uh, thing. Against that, economists always say flexible exchange rate helps the economy. My view is that for small countries like Bulgaria, like Georgia, we are so small relative to the rest of the world that actually the flexible exchange rate doesn't help us that much, that we're just too small to matter. I would argue that even Poland is too small to matter, although they think uh, otherwise, and they do think that the flexible exchange rate has helped them. But now Poland is entering a, a period of recession. So they managed to prolong the period of growth, but not escape it all um, altogether. So for smaller countries, my view would still be um, Better to pack, better to pack to where you're entering, if you're entering the European Union like uh, we were targeting them, better pack to the euro. It has some negatives, but the positives are bigger than uh, the negatives, and we're anyhow too small to matter in the global monetary world. Any other? So uh, this question is regarding the uh, doing business rating. So if I could put it in the nutshell, so when it was created, um, it was uh, based on the I ideology that uh, the less regulations, the better. Of course, with some, I mean, I would say exceptions, but but it's a general doctrine. Now, as I see, the uh, ideology is shifting towards uh, the fewer, the better, but, and then it depends. Yeah. And then we have sometimes even, in some cases, already the indications that the more, the better. So, for instance, I can recall new, um, how to say, standard for the uh, getting permit uh, topic, I don't know whether it's entered this year or it's coming uh, next year, that if the architects and uh, engineers are licensed, then the country gets credit. Well, whatever, I mean, somehow, uh -huh. uh, given some, some stamped papers, yeah, whatever you call it. So what, how would you comment on that? At first, so doing business was uh, created um, more than a dozen years ago by now, even though it's a global index, it really was created under the logic of transition. So both myself and some of the people who worked with me, Professor Andrei Schleifer at uh, Harvard was the other main uh, person, we were really scholars of transition at the time and we basically noticed uh, and there was at the same time, some evidence from Latin America. Hernando de Soto is famous for that, but there are a lot of other actually Latin American um, less uh, on uh, economists who basically are working in exactly the same direction. And actually transition, maybe not political transition so much, but economic transition in Central and Eastern Europe and Latin America is remarkably similar in the early to mid 90s in sort of getting rid of uh, socialist or communist uh, central planning kind of features and going towards a free market. So that was the ideological um, uh, basis for the doing business project and it roughly said what you say that the less government intervenes and tries to impose its view on how business activity should be done, the better. Not just for the, let's say, the conservative or liberal uh, reasoning that, uh, you know, less regulation is, uh, is better, this is some part of it, but also the observation coming from institutional economics 
that even if governments in developing or emerging markets have the right thing, the right idea how to, uh, how to regulate, they're too corrupt basically or too inept. So they're not going to be, they're going to screw it up. Um, uh, and this is, I've had again as finance minister, it's again in the book, I've had this discussion of the flat tax in Bulgaria. It curiously was implemented by a socialist government in Bulgaria just before us. The socialist government implemented it and immediately started asking to scrap it. So I had to fight the previous government's decision uh, to scrap its own um, uh, flat tax. And the discussion that I had uh, in Bulgaria, and that really actually worked as an argument, was not is this socially um, uh, optimal tax or not, but the comment of, so you see our tax office in Bulgaria, do you think these guys are efficient and uh, honest so that they are going to be able to implement a progressive tax system or some other tax system? You know who they are, right? And there was this understanding that, yeah, these guys, you know, even a flat tax is difficult for them to implement, so let's not impose something even more complicated. So I think that part is often forgotten in the discussion of regulation, but for me at least it's actually the more important part. That even if uh, a government in emerging markets has the right idea how, how to regulate, let's suppose, they're not going to be able to do it. Implementation is going to... Um, uh, to fail and therefore it's better to be simple at first and once you're rich then perhaps you can go to more complicated uh, levels of regulation so if you look at doing business Luxembourg or Belgium for example are not doing very well in the ranking Luxembourg is like number 60 or something like that they can afford it you know they can come they can do complicated things it's not good perhaps but at least you know they'll implement it uh, uh, somehow, but emerging markets cannot. So that's how we started. As most processes and most institutions, the World Bank is also a political institution, so there are also politicians uh, on the board deciding in which directions um, uh, it should uh, go and its product would go. And every year the doing business team, when I was manager, but also after that, has had this pressure to not have this, uh, if you like, institutional um, uh, framework, but basically to go towards better regulation. Not towards less or simple, but towards better regulation. Better regulation to me as an economist is a nonsensical thing. I mean, better regulation is what I think is better regulation when I'm in the government and the next government is going to think that other regulation is better regulation. So it's not well defined, which is why I don't like it. But politicians like it because they can interpret it however they like. And indeed, over the last three, four years, the Doing Business uh, project um, uh, has resisted, but not always successfully, this bent towards including some features of, um, uh, of better regulation. It's unavoidable in the, in the institutional, let's say, development of the product. I think over time there would be resistance to do too many changes, but we've seen this year that they are, I think, more than necessary um, uh, more than the necessary changes, um, but it's a process, and in this process, politics also plays a, plays a role. Anything else? We have just a few more minutes. Well. You were saying about some chances to use um, a flexible fiscal policy. I'm back to my question. Uh, and it can be sometimes maybe uh, successful in some occasions. But in, in reality, of course, we, we would doubt that maybe this will uh, push forward uh, some kind of parasitizing ideas. But the other thing is that if you leave alone these wrong uh, attitudes it can create. This is another thing that there is a political circle there and politicians, they need to win the elections again. So when they start such kind of policies, they want to stop maybe one moment, but then they, ha they have elections in, in future, then they cannot stop this immediately. Yep. They, they, they need to postpone and then they will 
continuously postponing, postponing, and I think that this is especially uh, very bad for small countries like yeah. like Jordan. No, I agree. So I think that's why for small countries, uh, that's bad for big countries as well. So this is what's happening in both France and Italy. France and Italy, different governments say that they're not populist, but actually they're populist. And the next government comes and says, we are not going to be populist, but actually they're populist as well. So it, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, contagious. I think it's a lot more contagious in... Uh, uh, in small countries because uh, very quickly it becomes obvious that uh, flexible fiscal policies don't work. And there are many reasons why in a small country flexible fiscal policy doesn't work. The main reason is that you don't produce many of the things that you want to spend on. So that's why when we have a discussion, the US probably can have a flexible, and actually it did, uh, 2009 to about 2011 a flexible fiscal policy because you know they're a large country they don't depend much on the rest of the world they produce most of the things they consume so they can do it germany to some extent in certain sectors tried remember 2009 10 11 they had this um, uh, basically fiscal stimulus that was if you buy a german car basically we buy your old car for free roughly speaking uh, but they produce cars, you know, the same, we had again a discussion in Bulgaria, let's have this type of policy, and I said, so what are we going to be buying? We don't have cars, we don't have fridges, what exactly are we going to buy that's made in Bulgaria so that we can have a flex flexible fiscal policy? At that point, politicians become very creative, and the more uneducated they are, the more creative they become, maybe we should actually create something that's Bulgarian and then buy it. Uh, so there are many politicians around the world that sort of when you tell them well, there's nothing to buy or not that many things to buy, they say, don't worry, we'll produce a Bulgarian car uh, or, you know, we'll produce a Bulgarian television and then uh, we'll buy uh, that and it becomes even worse. I think the countries in our region, because of the vestiges of uh, communism, even after 25 years, have this kind of uh, tendency to invent uh, how government should help even further. Uh, and then it becomes a big, uh, becomes a big uh, disaster. So, so small countries, flexible fiscal policies never work. Um, large countries, they may work, but you have to be large enough and not too corrupt to be able to um, pull it through, and some countries have. So that's why I say there are situations where you could use it within um, reason and it can smooth out the... Uh, economic uh, period. So Germany used it successfully during the period when all other countries are going down. Well, Germany is in a recession now, so you can postpone it, but you cannot completely uh, get rid of the business cycle. Well, yeah, okay. Last question, maybe. Uh, so my, my question is about the dilemmas which we have now. Uh, one hand, we have to uh, integrate in European Union and implement the policy which is developed by these countries and by this area, uh, which means also too much regulations, which we have. it's really, really much for the Georgia as well. And on the other hand, we have the kind of ranking as a doing business or many others, which is really good measuring instruments for the investors of the country. And uh, so uh, what do you think about this dilemma and which should be done firstly? To think yep. about this ranking or just starting to implement or find some solution to implement some regulations or, mm -hmm. and also create some inspections or other institutions? No, I understand. It's a very good question. So first, it's over, this question is overplayed, and it seems that today, since I've been asked by a number of journalists this question, so it must be really overplayed in uh, Georgia, or perhaps to... Okay. So it must be quite, uh, quite overplayed. So first, EU uh, regulation covers... Uh, is mostly in the social in the social area. So EU regulation covers very little in terms of the business area. It doesn't cover taxes. It you know taxes are sovereign. It doesn't have uh, 
starting a business, it doesn't uh, cover uh, contract enforcement, the judicial system is uh, independent, it doesn't cover uh, bankruptcy, um, it doesn't cover trading across borders, other than the fact that you have to have some uh, rules vis-a-vis -vis third parties, not vis-a-vis -vis your own. So in your case, you may have to impose some visas on non-Europeans. Yesterday, I was actually being checked, is Bulgaria in Europe or not? Yes, it is. Go. But, you know. Um, but outside of that, the only area that really affects business um, uh, business regulation and is dictated by the European Union is environmental, uh, environmental regulation, where indeed uh, both businesses and the government over time have to implement a number of regulations that most of our countries didn't have. And they do impose some cost, but they also have um, arguably good social benefits. But in the other areas, there is actually, at least in the areas that we study, there is no impact, uh, direct or indirect, of, um, of uh, European um, rules. There have been many discussions in which I have also participated in common fiscal policy, common tax policy, um, common policy towards new firms, but it has really not gone um, anywhere. There is such a thing as a European firm, so in addition to your own um, establishment of firms in Bulgaria, you can also establish a European firm uh, you want, but you have the choice. It's not uh, mandatory to do so. So the comment that you see we need to implement a lot of European regulations and things are going to get worse is simply not true in the, in the business, uh, uh, business area. There are many other areas in terms of healthcare, for example, or environment I mentioned, healthcare, some of the social areas where there are um, such uh, rules and regulations, but typically they're on the behavior of government, not on the behavior of... Um, of, uh, of firms. Um, so I would say that uh, on average in that regard, entry into the EU is either neutral or actually positive even. You cannot blame it on the EU for the fact that, um, that things may get worse. Close, yeah. Estonia is there as well, just just after Georgia. So no, there are quite a number of uh, quite a number of um, European countries that uh, that UK is actually quite high. Ireland is quite high. It has fully the European uh, uh, regulation. UK has most of the EU regulation. I think Ireland is now in the top ten, so uh, close to the top ten. So it's not. Yeah. Okay. No, so it's, it's, very use, it's very easy to blame the EU for this or that. Usually they do things that they can be blamed for, but this is not one of these. Uh, no That's right. So in this case, uh, you need to defend the EU. They, they do the right thing. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for coming. It was a very short notice. So I also appreciate the, uh, the attention. Thank you.